Hey everyone, I'm back from hiatus and ready to answer your questions. So please stick around. Hi, I'm Michael, KB9VBR, your host for Ham Radio Q&A. Thanks for joining me. I'm on a mission to inspire and educate the amateur radio community. So if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to this channel. Well, it's been a busy couple of months and I've slacked on the production of videos big time. So springtime tends to get very um, busy uh, building antennas and I've had a couple other big projects going on in the background. Hence, you haven't seen anything for the last, oh man, almost two months. But, um, so I apologize for that. And um, I thought I'd catch up with things over that have happened on the last few weeks by kind of going through some of the questions I've received from previous videos. So I'm going to share a few of those interest, more interesting ones here. Um, in the video, the IC718 uh, transceiver controls, uh, viewer Ham Radio Comms writes, Excellent video, beautiful high def view of the radio. The only cor correction I'd mention is you said filters are to narrow the bandwidth on CW or single sideband. Actually, add-on filters can narrow or expand the bandwidth. On CW, it almost always narrows it from the stock filter, but on a single sideband, the stock filter might be 2.4 kilohertz, and the add-on filters can be maybe 1.8, 2.3, 2.9, or 3.3 kilohertz for instance. So many uh, wider options are available than, than the stock filter. Well, you are correct, and thanks for that clarification. Filters can be used to both narrow or expand your bandwidth. Uh, I think my, in my explanation, I just chose to, uh, to say that filters narrow the bandwidth, um, which is primarily the reason most people use them. And in the follow-up to that, Ham Radio Comms uh, writes, yes, totally agree on using narrower. I only see the wider on sideband locally in the north, uh, northeast for NVIS, near vertical incident sky wave propagation, 300 to 400 mile contacts for nets and local rag chews with hams who are into audio. They want the greatest fidelity, so 3.3 kilohertz are common. But as you know, this is the opposite from what we want in DXing, where you can get more punch out of your signal with uh, 2.3 kilohertz. So, I, so he has the 2.9 kilohertz option in the FT897D and he, and he uses it for receive and or transmit. So uh, you can sound good or fuller at the other end of those NVIS type contacts. Uh, thanks for that. You know, that's, uh, you made some really great points there. Narrow filters do help with DX reception and high fidelity HF ham radio. Well, that's a whole nother can of worms I don't really want to get into right now. And those super wide, but those, uh, just to say, those super wide settings can cause interference to others. So just be mindful of that if you're going the high fidelity route with your filtering. Also, be sure to check out Ham Radio Com's channel. I'm gonna throw the link up in the upper corner of the screen here. It's, fill, it's full of Ed's personal ham radio experiences. You might find some of them interesting like I did. So, speaking of the ICOM 718, Binoy asks, hi, do you prefer the IC718 or the FT450D, that's a Yesu, as your first HF? Please advise, thanks. Well, that's a great question. And I've had some experience with the FT450, but I've never really owned one. It has, a, it has some nice features, uh, such as a built-in tuner, and uh, the DSP functions on the 450 are a lot better than uh, what you're going to find in the IC718. The downside is that the Yezu has um, more functions that are, are hidden or buried uh, beneath menus. And, um, so it takes more button pushings to activate a function on a Yesu 450 than it's going to uh, happen on the IC718. So the ICOM's got a much simpler menu structure. What I like about the IC718 is that you can sit down in front of it and start operating with a minimum of, of instruction. In fact, I've taken this radio to field day many times and with a five minute lesson, I can get the newest of hams on the air with that radio. The built-in tuner of the FT450, it's very nice, but it only tunes to uh, 3 to 1 or less. So it's not going to be too useful if you're using a random wire or a non-resident type antenna 
which um, is, seems to be popular with New Hams these days. So I'd still look for an external tuner for those options. Uh, when I bought my ICOM, you know, the 718, the FT415 wasn't available yet, so I didn't really have that choice. But if I was going to do it over again, you know, I'd, very, I'd take a very long, long and hard look at the, at the Yesu, and, that, and I might go in that direction. Finally, Brian asks, so what is a good power supply for this rig? Well, a good power supply for a basic HF rig is going to be a 13.8 volt power supply capable of at least 20 amps of output. That'll work well with the ICOM and also any of the other entry level uh, HF rigs. I'm using a 25 amp Astron switching power supply for my HF station. But MFJ and others, they all make very fine uh, power supplies. I prefer the switching supplies over the uh, transformer based uh, regulated power supplies for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, the switching supplies, they're a lot lighter to move and um, they're also more energy efficient than the regulated supplies are. Also, uh, the newer switching supplies don't, aren't as noisy as the old, the old switching supplies used to be. So you, you, they've got better filtering in them and the switching supplies really do work uh, very good and are excellent uh, power supplies for an HF station. Uh, in my PiStar digital, uh, digital radio hotspot video, I received a message from John Betty. Uh, you may have heard by now the Zumspot development developer has paused in sales. Apparently he wants to devote time to the next iteration of the Zumspot, which is good news. Well, maybe there'll be an announcement at Dayton, he surmises. Well, that would be cool. Well, thanks for that heads up. I didn't really know, um, I hadn't really heard that news at the time, and I know from experience it can be tough for uh, a small developer and to handle all aspects of the design, production, and sales of, of electronics device. So maybe taking a, a step back uh, will allow um, the ZumSpot uh, developers to kind of uh, reflect, uh, rework the plan, and explore different licensing options for their product. Uh, I think part of the problem that the ZumSpot had was that it was released as an open source product and um, the, uh, a lot of Chinese manufacturers quickly latched onto that and made knockoffs that were very inexpensive. Uh, these jumbo type hotspots uh, don't have the quite lo same level of quality control or um, sophistication or, or finesse that, uh, that the ZumSpot had. So users were kind of experiencing issues with these uh, knockoff hotspots that you may not have found uh, with an authentic model. So my recommendation still is to stick one of the le legit manufacturers of hotspots. The DV Mega uh, kits are great. Uh, Shark RF, if you want an all-in-one solution, are really good choices. In my video, Skywarn, a severe weather criterion report uh, formats, Link writes, found the Skywarn net in my area and had the chance to report on severe weather. Was extremely cool, but I still need a ton of practice on it. Well, that's how I got started with storm spotting. I picked up a severe weather net uh, on my scanner, kept listening to it, and soon I got my license. But if you're new to storm spotting, I recommend uh, some online training. Then maybe it's a, it's a great first step. If you're unable, um, some areas have in-person classes. Usually you can find those in late winter or early spring. Um, but the online training, it's a great substitute. I believe skywarn.org has an online training module. Or otherwise, uh, the training course by our local NWS uh, office uh, rec recommends. Uh, I'll put a link down in the description below. You'll find more information on that. Uh, whatever training uh, you complete, just let your Skywarn uh, organizer know that you've taken the training and you're ready to participate in the nets. Well, that's it for another month. Uh, keep those questions and comments coming. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to do a uh, Your Questions Answered Field Day special. Uh, so, I've participa participated in ARRL Field Day off and on for almost the last 20 years. So, um, if you've got any questions about the world's largest operating event, I probably got the answer to it. For more ham radio articles and information, be sure to check out my blog at www.jpol-antenna.com. Um, and also, if you like this video, you know, just give me that big thumbs up. It's really appreciated. Also, check out some of the other uh, videos on my channel. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you're notified when new videos are produced. 
a lot more on the way this summer, so you're gonna wanna stay tuned. Um, I'm Michael, KB9VBR. Have a great day, thanks for watching, and 73.